thing right now is student loans. I don't think anyone's paying student loans right now. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I say the word student loans when I'm talking about anything on, I think even Wealth Building Monday, I mentioned student loans, but I can't tell you how much we emphasize student loans. Young Millionaires Association. <laughs> yeah, see, that's the association. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It is Why My Nation podcast episode number 36, guys. And I have a special guest with us this morning. It is Miss Amy. Hi. Hi. Um, first and foremost, we want to thank everyone for all of your support for our Real Estate Wednesday podcast last Wednesday. It was amazing how many views, how many likes and comments. So we really appreciate that, you guys, for following. So y'all like, comment, and subscribe. Um, and that way you get all of the alerts for all of the episodes that we have coming out. Uh, and so I'm going to let our special guest, Miss Amy Osborne, she is from Homebridge Mortgage. She's going to tell you a little about herself and what she does. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> um, I am with Homebridge Financial Services. I've been in the mortgage industry since 2002 and very thankful to be with Homebridge, uh, for just over six years now. Um, and Homebridge, I'll give you a little bit of background about Homebridge um, and lending. There are three different platforms um, when it comes to lending. You have a bank, which everyone is familiar with. You have a broker, which works as a middleman. And what they do is close in someone else's name. And then you have a platform like Homebridge, which is a correspondent lender or a wholesale lender. And the nice thing about that is everything is done by us. So we do all the processing, we do all our underwriting, our closing, our funding, and sometimes even our servicing. So it's a much more controlled process. Oh, nice, mm -hmm. nice. So I know a lot of those words, people probably don't understand a lot of them. Um, so what we're here to do today is we are going to... Um, give you some information more in depth about the lending process for your home. So how to uh, obtain a loan, what are lenders really looking for um, when you are going to purchase a home? Because we, we talked in the previous episodes about um, can't, how much home can you afford? How much you know, where does your credit score need to be? So now what we're going to do is we're going to get to step number three, which is once I get to the lender, what is that lender going to look for? And um, how can I make sure that I'm ready to be with a lender? So that's why I got my, my guest Amy on. I'm so excited because <laughs> she is so knowledgeable about everything um, in the lending world. So um, I guess we could start by when you have a, a client come to you, whether they be through an, a real estate agent who is referring them over to you, or um, they're just inquiring about a, a home mortgage, a home loan. Mm -hmm. um, what is the first step in that process? What What is in your, you know, for your company? What does the first step look like? Uh, well, the first thing I would say is the home buying process is, can be overwhelming for some people. Um, and try to just take a deep breath and align yourself with a good realtor like Rebecca um, or somebody that you trust um, and know that even if you aren't ready right now, you have to start the process somewhere and you can always make a plan to get to the point where you're ready. So I have so many people that come to me and say, well, I know I'm not ready right now, so I'll call you in six months or I'll call you in 10 months. There's no point in doing that. So back to your question is we start with a loan application, which is very simple to do. 
We get all of your personal and financial information, and we determine whether or not you're ready to buy right now, or again, if we need to make a plan to get you to the point where you're ready to buy. Got you. Got you. And so when people are filling out the application, Mm -hmm. and we talk a lot about a lot of times people just research and and they may come across um, Homebridge, and they're like, oh, I want to apply with them. What would you say um, to those people who just take that that step without first acknowledging where they are? Like, um, I guess, would you say you need to know where your credit is before you take the step in filling out the application? Like, how much research and things do you need to know as a consumer before you take that step in filling out that application? I think it's a it's a good idea for anybody, um, I should say for everybody to be monitoring their credit. Uh, I also think that it's very important to make sure that as soon as you are able to start building your credit, there are quite a few people that, you know, come out of college and maybe haven't thought about that. So especially as parents, I think it's really important to er- encourage our children to start building credit as soon as they are willing and able to do that. Uh, and there's a reason we have access to free credit reports is then you are able to check that at least once a year and make sure there's no fraud, there's no issues. Uh, and I do think it's very important to to monitor that. And if you haven't been, reach out to a lender or go online and do it yourself. Right, right. And we talk, and what's crazy is we talk a lot about um, the importance of finances when it comes to the loan process and obtaining a loan for a home mortgage. So what are some, I guess, once the person fills out the application, what are some things that you see that are red flags at, for consumers as far as their finances and making sure they're financially ready to take that next step? The, the last 12 months, lenders consider that to be the most indicative of a person's current financial situation. Anything that is medical can be omitted with every loan program. Everything else in the last 12 months is most important. The next level is 12 to 24 months. And anything beyond 24 months is typically something that we can overcome unless it's a mortgage or a bankruptcy. Gotcha. So, I mean, you're hearing it from the expert. These are things that I've told you like in weeks previous. And I mean, you're just reiterating really everything that that we've been trying to to tell you over the last few episodes is your credit has to be in a good position. Um, Can you tell them a little bit about some of the products that you guys offer and like what the scoring models look like for them to be able to qualify for those products? Absolutely. With, uh, With Homebridge, we pretty much do everything. Construction loans, FHA, VA, USDA, conventional, mobile homes, We can finance everything but raw land. That's something that I have a great contact for, but that's really the only thing that we cannot do. As I mentioned earlier with the three different platforms of lending, one of the nice things about uh, HomeBridge is since we do everything ourselves, we have the ability to take risk where it makes sense. So our credit score minimums are a little bit lower than most. We go to 600, and with exception, we can actually go down to 580. Now, prior to COVID, everybody was pretty much at 580 and things have gotten a little bit stricter. So that's just where we are right now. But I can tell you with people with blemished credit, having mortgage history or rent history is the most important thing to us because we can overcome so much if we can show that somebody has successfully paid a mortgage or rent in the last 12 months. Because logically, we can look at that and say, okay, well, they've been paying rent at $1,500 a month. Surely they can pay a $1,600 a month mortgage payment. So we have the ability to look at things like that and say, have, if they've been doing this successfully, they can continue doing it. Gotcha. And so really y'all can do anything, just it sounds like just about any type of loan. That's why she's one of my good people. <laughs> <laughs> um, because it's, it's great. And 
Um, I know that a lot of times you have people that look and um, we talked about you need to research, you know, your lenders, your insurance companies and things like that when you're going to into the home buying process um, where some of that needs to go onto the buyer where they're doing some research. Tell me some red flags that may come up, you know, if they're researching different lenders, are there any red flags they need to look for if, you know, whether that's going to be a good fit for them or, um, you know, things that you have seen Absolutely. from your side of it? Um, first of all, I will tell you that you really only need one pre-approval. Once you know your financial situation and what you're pre-approved for, that lender can tell you what your credit score is and you can go and you can get estimates from as many people as you want. Each lender does not need to pull your credit and you don't need to do an application with them just to get an estimate. So if you choose a lender to do a pre-approval, then you can go out and you can check um, rates and fees. Be careful though, it's not just about the rate. I could quote a 30-year fix today at 3%, and I could also quote in the exact same scenario, I could quote 2.5%. Obviously, the person's going to love 2.5%, but you may be paying 1 or 2 or 3 points in order to get that. So don't ever call a lender and just get a rate. I would get the breakdown of all of the closing costs so you can make sure that you're comparing apples to apples. And um, I know a lot of people aren't going to know what points are. Could you explain, like, you know, because lenders do throw out, you know, well, we can buy your rate down this many points, you know, the, the mm -hmm. scenario you just gave. Can you kind of break that down for them and, and tell them what, what are points? Absolutely. So points um, or origination fees are a percentage of the loan to buy down a below market rate. So f the general rule of thumb is 1% or one point of the loan amount generally buys down the rate a quarter of a percent. Now that's not always the case. That is just a general rule. So for example, if the par rate or a standard market rate on a 30-year fix today with someone with good credit is 2.75 and you're borrowing $300,000, you could pay $300,000, you could pay $3,000 and buy it down to 2.5%. That gets built into the closing costs, which is why it's so important to get that estimate. Because when I provide an estimate to a potential buyer, they're going to see the lender fees, they're going to see any um, applicable points, all of the estimated attorney's fees, taxes and insurance, if applicable, any interest based on your closing date, and then your total cash due at closing. And that's just important because then you can take an estimate from each lender and compare. Well, if somebody's telling me I need $50,000 at closing and the other person's telling me I need $60,000 at closing, I need to go look at those closing costs and see what the difference is. And also, we talk about how having a financial budget is so important. Because a lot of what we see is, you know, people are like, well, I want to get a USDA loan because it's 100%. You know, they're all about the 100% loans. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes they really don't understand um, the pros and cons of those types of loans, you know, with the um, just debt to income ratios. Can you explain those a little bit so that they have an understanding, you know, debt to income ratio in general? Can you do a, a breakdown of what you guys look for as far as their debt to income goes? Absolutely. Each program has different guidelines, but 
for example, USDA, since you brought up USDA, USDA's standard guidelines are a front ratio, which I'll talk about in just a minute, of 29% and a back ratio of 41%. Now, someone with good credit, we can generally push that a little bit, but there are two different sets of ratios. Your front ratio is what's called your housing ratio, and that is your gross income divided by what the new housing payment is going to be. And then the back ratio is your total debt ratio, which is your gross income, the new mortgage payment, plus all your other monthly payments. Now, one of the things that people don't realize before they do the application is the big thing right now is student loans. I don't think anyone's paying student loans right now. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I say the word student loans when I'm talking about anything on, I think even Wealth Building Monday, I mentioned student loans, but I can't tell you how much we emphasize student loans. So the fact that you just said student loans just brings joy to me because mm. I, I don't think that, I think that's just so overlooked by, by, you know, people that are in general, like generalization. You're absolutely right. And people understandably think I have student loans, but I'm not making payments on those. So they're not factored in and they're not today, but you're looking to potentially get a 30 year loan and eventually you're going to have to pay those back. And because of everything that happened in 2008, now lenders have to foresee those potential problems. So each program has a different set of rules. With USDA, they require that we take a half percent of the balance and put that in as payment. So if you have a $30,000 student loan, we have to count 0.5% against you in your total debt ratios. FHA is stricter and they require 1%. Uh, so that's something that a lot of times can infect, excuse me, affect somebody's qualifying. Got you. And so being a lender and seeing, you know, your average income, your average people, what their debts amount to, what can you tell people about if they're going to buy a house and um, where their income is, how much would you say of the income should that person's house payment be if you had to put a percent on it from a lender perspective? With, that's a tough question. So the standard old school, like when I started um, in 2002, the standard max was 29%. So take your gross monthly income and 29% of that, and that's where your housing payment should be. Now, that being said, in our area, especially rent is so expensive that people are accustomed to paying a whole lot more. And with good credit, you can, I mean, I've had people approved up to 40% uh, with good credit. So that's, that's a tough one, but the standard ratio is 29%. 29%. Mm -hmm. And that would keep them in a good budget month over month and make sure that you can actually afford the, the monthly payments that you're getting into. Um, another thing that I think is a great topic to talk about, because a lot of times I'll have clients come in as an agent and they're like, well, I want my monthly payment to be $600 a month. And I'm like, well, is that before your taxes, insurance and your PMI or is that after? <laughs> um, so can you kind of break down how that rolls into a monthly payment and how you guys calculate that on the lender side? Because we've we've touched based a little bit about that on, in previous episodes. So I really want to just break that down a little bit so people have a better understanding of it. Understood. So your, uh, the mortgage payment, it consists of the principal and interest payment, which is the, the money that you have borrowed, your hazard or homeowner's insurance, and the borrower elects who they want to go with and they set that up on their own. The property taxes are completely based on the house that you choose. And if you go with a conventional loan and put less than 20% down or any government loan, meaning USDA or FHA, you will also have mortgage insurance. Mortgage insurance, it's called private mortgage insurance or PMI. That is additional insurance, not for you, but it protects the lender in case of default. So conventional, again, is less than 20% down. 
FHA and USDA now require mortgage insurance for the life of the loan. And the only program that doesn't have it at all is VA for veterans. Gotcha. Okay. So y'all got that? Y'all taking notes, right? Because y'all have the expert here and she's (laughs) giving y'all some really good stuff. (laughs) And so y'all need to be writing this stuff down because this is excellent information. Uh, So, and, you know, me, me and you have worked some transactions together. And, you know, one thing I love about um, working with, with you on the lending side is we're outside of the box thinkers. Um, and, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. And so I love that we're able to create things for clients and, and get them in the best situation possible. Um, so is there anything from the lender side that you really think that clients just need to be prepared for in order to make that process seamless for them? Because we talk a lot about what we do on the real estate side and how to make that seamless. On the lender side, how how do you make that a more seamless process? What's some things that they can do on their end to really um, get prepared for the, that process? Because it is, like you said, you got to take a deep breath and you have to be ready, right? You do. I think the most important thing is making sure that you align yourself with somebody that you're comfortable with and somebody that you trust. Um you know, I, I don't know a whole lot about financial planning. So thankfully I've aligned myself with somebody that I completely trust. They help me tell, tell me what I need to do. And that makes it easy for me. I feel like the process is is the same on then this end is if you're working with Rebecca, you don't have to worry about anything because Rebecca and her team, they're going to tell you, they're going to set up your home inspection. They're going to set up your closing. They're going to do everything for you. I think the same applies with lending. If you have somebody that you trust and somebody that really knows what they're doing, they're going to guide you through. It's not going to be the easiest process in the world because there is a lot involved, but they're going to make it as seamless as possible. I'll tell you the, one of the biggest things that I tell people on the front end is cash is our worst enemy. I don't know if you guys have ever talked about that, but with lending, we have to source every dollar. So if it's money coming out of a paycheck or a tax refund or mom and dad gave you a check for your birthday, we can document where all that money came from. If you have cash sitting in a shoebox under your bed, put it in the bank. Not everyone trusts the banks, I understand that, but if it's cash, we can't source it and that means you can't use it for the loan and that's something that we're seeing more and more every day. And I'm glad that you brought that topic up. Mm -hmm. Um, about the cash. Um, so let's say that I'm a buyer and I want to purchase a home for $200,000. That's the average going right, you know, in the, in the area um, that we're in. What would you say to be on the, the, the worst case scenario? How much do I need to have saved up to be able to really be comfortable buying a house? That's a tough question. Things are pretty, uh, and it depends what kind of loan program do you want me to, to say? Um, well, just kind of do a variance. Okay. You know, like a best case scenario, if you're doing a USDA, if you're doing an FHA, just, you know, what, what they should be. Worst case scenario. It honestly completely depends on your credit. If you have decent to good credit, you could have $10 in the bank and a family member could gift everything at closing and it would be no problem. We'd have to obviously document it as a gift. If your credit scores are lower or you've had blemishes, especially again in the last one to two years, then it is incredibly helpful not only to have your own funds for closing, but to have what's called reserves. So if you are living paycheck to paycheck, your credit is bad and you're getting a gift for the down payment and you don't have any extra money, that's going to be, it's not, I'm not saying it's not doable, but that's going to be more difficult than the person who gets a gift for down payment. But then when we get to closing, maybe they have one or two or three months of reserves. And what reserves are is mortgage payments. 
So if your payment is $1,000 a month and we go to closing and you still have $3,000 in the bank, that's going to make a lender feel more comfortable because they have backup money. If something happens and they get overextended one month, they have a little bit of extra savings. And that doesn't have to be checking in savings. It can be 401k, it can be investments. Anything that is accessible can be used as reserves. Okay, got you. Um, and in the lending world, because, you know, bad credit, people's like, well, my credit says 640, is that bad? Um, in, in the lending world, what would you like for your loans? Like a FHA, I know we talk, you talked about um, you could go down to a 580, but that person is definitely going to need more cash flow than a person at a 640 or a 660 or a 680. So uh, on a scale, what would you say is considered, you know, bad for you guys? And what is considered, you know, you may have a little more wiggle room as far as your cash flow goes? I started off checking it every other week, just like most people do. Then it got out of control. I couldn't help myself. I started checking it day after day after day. I didn't realize that I was becoming addicted until my wife said something. What did she say? She said... It's just a credit score, relax. Are you checking your credit score? Huh? Uh, hold on. That's a great question. Going back to what you said in the beginning, um, with the credit, it, it is based definitely on credit, but it's also rent history and what what are the reasons your credit is scored that way? There are some people that just have new credit and maybe one blemish, and so their scores are lower. So it, it may not necessarily be that it's bad, but credit is how much good you have versus bad. So if you only have one good account and one bad account, your credit may be lower, but it's not really, the whole credit profile isn't necessarily bad. And I know right. you guys have talked about that a little bit. So with conventional loans, conventional interest rates and the mortgage insurance is credit score based. So anything over 740 is going to give, get you the best possible pricing. And then conventional rates change for every 20 points. So if you drop below 720, 700, 680, and so forth. On government loans, they are much less strict on credit score so anything above 660 is going to get you the best interest rate and the mortgage insurance is the same for everybody. It's really not until when you get under 620 that things get to be a little bit more difficult. So to answer your question, I would say 620, when you get below that, there's usually more recent delinquencies and things that we have to repair. Now, going back to what I said initially, if you think your credit score is under 620, that doesn't mean that you have to wait. That just means let a lender, you know, and Rebecca, let us look at that. And it may not be a, yes, you're ready right now, but let's make a plan. So maybe you're ready in two or three months or even six months, but at least you know where you stand. And also, um, you touched base on this just a little bit, and I want to get back to it. Um, you were talking about credit building and I know that we've even encountered people and we're like, you have to get a secured card. You have to get a, like a, a secured revolving account. How important is that building process for you guys to fund that loan? It's, it's crucial. If you don't have credit, there's, there's less that we can do. Um, traditional credit is important, but we can, add to that or we can build with manual credit which means rent utilities cell phone bills car insurance anything that you pay monthly but that's not as good as traditional credit ideally even if you don't have a mortgage or rent you could have you would would have a combination of installment loans and revolving accounts revolving accounts are really important make sure you use them and try not to carry a balance more than 40% of the available limit because that's showing the credit bureaus that you could spend more, but you're choosing not to. But you have to make sure that you use them. The other thing that you can do now, if you are renting and the utilities are in your name, you can self-report those to the credit bureau and those will help build your credit. The one thing that I will tell you to please try and avoid is any type of short-term loan, like a payday loan or a cash advance. 
I mean, I'm giving it to her. She's getting it. <laughs> She's getting it. Because, whoo, I think I just said that three weeks ago. I think I said it. I think I said it, guys. I think I said it. You're she, a thousand percent right. It's yeah. because what they do is it's a 90 or 120 day loan. It doesn't give you enough time to actually build good credit. And then they refinance it and they start back over. And I'm sure Rebecca probably went through this with you, but with any new account, it is initially going to pull you down a little bit. It's completely normal because you have a brand new debt without any history. But once you get three, four, five, six payments, it's going to do so much good for your, for your credit. If you do a 90 day account, and it just keeps churning. That's just damaging your credit. It doesn't help you at all. Yes. I've had this conversation a lot. <laughs> so, Hey, she's the expert in lending. So you get to hear it from her. You get to hear it on the credit side. We're only trying to guide you guys and make this process absolutely seamless for you so that you can ultimately reach your goal in purchasing a home. So um, I'm going to let you tell them if, you know, if they're an agent and they're looking for a lender for their client or, you know, if they have any lender questions, what is a good way to get in contact with you? You can call me anytime on my cell phone or email. Um, and I will tell you, because of all the things that I've shared about HomeBridge, I certainly do not want to interfere with your existing relationships. But if it's something that your lender can't do, I'm happy to take a second look. There are there have been so many situations that lender other lenders have turned somebody down and they just get heartbroken. But maybe maybe because of our platform and the way we do things, maybe it's something that we can do. And between Rebecca and I, if it's a credit issue, a lot of times we can work through it. Okay. So you've heard it. You can phone her, email her, and um, we can put all of that in the description. So if you look in the description, then we'll have her contact information. So she's very, she's excellent with communication. That's why, you know, I love working with her because I'm a communication person and so is she. So she can answer questions and, you know, we're outside of the box thinker. She's an outside of the box thinker. So where there's a will, there's a way for you guys. So I think that's about all. I am super excited that we have Miss Amy on this evening. We're going to give her another <laughs> round of applause for all that great information that we got from her. So we are going to outro it. And thank you guys for joining. Like, comment, subscribe, click the button. You can do it. Are you doing it? I see you. I'm watching you. Are you doing it? Thank you again, Amy. Thank you. You were amazing and gave me some great information. So I will see you guys on Friday.